All right, family. So here we go. I'm going to start uh, saying the podcast starts at 9, uh, 45 or 10 o'clock in order to, uh, I don't know, maybe possibly defeat the bugs in the system. Uh, first and foremost, I wanted to take the time and uh, the opportunity. First, I'll just let everybody know last week's show was, you know, very high energy and intense. Uh, I call that the, um, you know, the breathing out. And today we're actually going to do some breathing in. So if you come for the theatrics, you may be, you know, just a little bit disappointed uh, because I want to take the time um, and the energy to actually just dial in what we're doing here and also to speak to those that join the show uh, every week faithfully. Thank you so much and are really looking for clarity. There's a lot of uh, elders that join in the show. They email me after the podcast from time to time. There's parents uh, that join the show, you know, to get you know, wisdom for themselves and for their children. And, uh, and we appreciate that also. But sometimes, you know, when it's just the theatrics at times, meaning, you know, it's high energy, you know, there's the board, you know, we're diving through, you know, lots of um, occult knowledge. We want to make sure and all that, that it doesn't just become entertainment, that we actually realize what's being said and uh, that we're able to apply what is necessary uh, to apply, especially between shows and after shows, so that way when we come in for another session, we can keep growing. Um, my goal is not to sit here and to basically just bring a performance so everybody hits the like button. Uh, I've been doing this for 10 years, so that means that at a certain point you would get very mature about you know, what you're doing and how you're handling yourself because it takes a lot of energy uh, to push out on this type of consistent basis. And so with that being said... Uh, because we just came over an eclipse and a full moon, we're actually still in a, a very strong lunar point. The magnetics are high. Uh, I wanted to first just paraphrase this today of the port importance of meditation. And this is obviously because, you know, a lot of the energies that we're talking about and the things that we're dealing with, is, it's all going on inside. And so this means that if you don't really have a strong grip on your own consciousness, like your, your brain and, and your thoughts, this could really wreck things for you. It just will put more things for you to think about, not things that are going to put you at ease and allow you to be comfortable within yourself and to reduce the level of anxiety and angst and all of the things that the anger, you know, all the angst that will put you at times into a state that is not really harmonic and, um, is not really going to benefit you from a level of health, physical health, spiritual health, mental health, etc. And I want to also um, talk about very briefly before we begin this opening uh, meditation or just of clearing the space that as we've been discussing, what's most important is for you to learn how to manage your plants or planets your power plants, if you may, that are going on inside of you and developing inside of you. And just like any garden and with any plant, you have to pay careful attention. It's like, you know, we get so much used to in the society kind of going to the store and just picking up this, this, these fruits, vegetables, and uh, all the things that we eat, we pay for it, we dip. And that is obviously not how the food gets to you. You know, there's an entire process where it has to be cultivated, especially if it's organic food. And a big part of that cultivation of the plant is actually exactly what you have to do for yourself um, religiously, if you may. It's like the maintenance, like what you got to keep going on, keep doing all the time in order to make sure that your plants and planets and powers grow up uh, to not reap thorns and thistles for you or to not be aborted uh, during the harvest. And what I'm talking about is as a farmer, you know that there's different things that you got to do for this plant. You have to provide the minerals and nutrients for it. And so this means for your organs and, you know, we could speak in totality for your body. You have to put in the proper minerals and nutrients for it even to grow. Like if you notice, there is a phenomenon where if you try to keep raising a plant on the same soil, Every time the plant is deplete, every time the plant grows, you rip it up, put another plant down, and you just keep doing that. Eventually, the, the soil itself becomes depleted because the soil is, is full of microorganisms and uh, full of different levels of minerals and nourishment to get that plant to grow, but it depletes those minerals, so you have to put that back in there. And so there's that. 
And then there's also a plethora of other uh, different life forms that just want to eat on your harvest. And a lot, of, uh, a lot of times, you know, when we think about these ideas of uh, vampires and things of a parasitic nature and even demons that are, are not exactly uh, pro-human, etc., all this is really just coming from the aspect of that you as a plant also am producing fruit that there's other things that would just as soon as go to the store on you, just go and even try to buy the energy from you and then take the energy from you and, and go on with it rather than going through the entire cultivation process. And this is, of course, why it's very important for us to, to uh, understand the Netaru in nature uh, because it actually gives us a blueprint to everything. So when we're asking questions, many of those questions, if not all of those questions, I, I would say if there's something that we've invented, then we have to answer the questions about that. But if we're talking about the things that have always been going on the planet for a countless amount of time, uh, in a countless amount of time, then we can look to nature to get the answers for that. So this process of first making sure you're nurtured properly. First of all, actually, it starts off with, you know, making sure that you're planting yourself deep enough. If, if you stay on the surface to life, then you will always come under the influence of the external rays. So this means that, you know, even as symbolically, we're on the crust of the planet, but the, there's the sky, which is the, the firmament, which is actually uh, in itself uh, a, a life, a life force. But, a lot of times when we're not looking internally, we can get caught up, at, stay, caught up on staying on the surface of ourselves. And a while ago, we had already ciphered this word surface. We know the word sir, sar, sore, and sir all is a reference to a snake um, or the, the great serpent, as you may. And then there's also this other reference to face, which is, can be taken just as face value. So it's basically saying the word is saying that if, you, if you're just staying on the surface or the top, then you're never really going deep. You're never really seeing what exactly uh, is really happening. And in fact, the surface is a reference to the skin, as we've talked about before. The skin is the surface of your body. The skin is also known as the shining one because when you do go into you know, your, um, your metaphysical journeys and you open up your third eye, you'll notice that the whole body is shining. That shining is coming from the skin. They even talked about this, um, I think they call it the soponym, but they talk about this even in the ancient Kabbalistic texts about that having a shining or scaly hide. And of course, this is from the predecessors, which are, are, are more reptilian in nature. They have these scales on the body, but it's also been passed to the human as their skin or quasi exoskeleton, but it actually really shines. And that shining also produces somewhat of an illusionary phenomena where one can only pay attention to the shine and the glow of it, like just taking things for what's called face value and not really looking deep into it, you know, kind of judging the book by its cover in every essence. And, and this is why we know for sure that anyone that is still just talking about knowledge about colors and surface level stuff like, you know, what the person looks like and, 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 and all of that surface stuff that they, they haven't gone deep yet. So true, they'll have some knowledge, but they won't, it won't be deep knowledge. It'll, it'll always be terminated somewhere within an illusionary state. So what this encourages us to do is it encourages us to get out of the surface, get out of the illusion, get out of the judgments, get out of just, you know, thinking about just the culture the, supervis the superficial aspects of, of what we've created in the external reality, and it encourages us to go deeper, let's say the center of the earth, the center of self, where we know that the womb and all forms of creation are. And then when we do that, we can then, again, look at all the things going on around us, such as nature, and then ask ourselves, one, did I plant myself deep enough as a seed? And we've had a, some pretty massive... Uh, builds on just exactly how that process goes from you turning into the fruit to the seed and how your abundance and powers and all that stuff kind of get stripped off of you as payment during the fall. And then once you, you know, plant yourself and you hit or you hit or you impact how deep you go is really how strong you're going to become. And once you're planted, now you must, you know, set in the roots. So this root would really be about, you know, your ancestry. It would be about 
you know, your moralistic bearing, how much you're aware of self and who you truly are, you know, like your stability, your foundation. So you would set your roots. And then once you set your roots, because this is all a process, it's a metamorphosis. So you don't want to be in a rush on something like this because, you know, there is that parable of the sower, which I always found that that was just, you know, wherever they grabbed that from and put it in the Bible, but he was on, you know, dropping them jewels. But it's real that if you don't plant yourself deep enough, then the moment that some wind comes by, you're just going to be torn up from the roots. And this is what it's like when, you know, you're just accepting certain information, but you haven't really been able to prove that yourself or to get deep with that information. The moment someone comes along with a opposing story, because there's always going to be a yin and yang in the reality, it's paradoxical, then you're going to lose that too. And you're going to be off to, to something else, blowing in the wind, right? And so, you know, you're encouraged to, to plant yourself deeper. And then <laughs> as you spring forth, the next thing is, as the farmer knows, now you have to, and going through this germination process, you know, you have to find allies. That's really what the permaculture is really about. It's like there are things that are naturally symbiotic for you, and then there's things that are somewhat predatory. And when you get with the symbiotic nature of the reality around you, it actually defends or shields or protects you from the parasites, this is what happens with plants. There are plants that actually protect other plants from parasites, and they do that for each other. You know, that's called uh, kingdom supporting kingdoms, uh, as it's called around the tribe. And so in this process, though, it, this may sound simple, and it may be like, okay, well, get on to the, you know, we want to hear about the archon today again. Or, but truly, if you don't have a really strong foundation and you're not really planted as I said, those surface ideas are just going to blow you right into more confusion and, and more despair and more anxiety. And, and that's not what we're here for. That's not what tribe is here for. We are the symbiotics. We are a part of your permaculture and getting you into a space to where you're not only comfortable with yourself, but you're also capable of growing without somebody coming and plucking up, you know, what you've worked so hard to, to put into play. And so as we see with just that simple metaphor of understanding how life uh, comes into existence and how plants grow, well, actually, I won't say life comes into existence, but how plants grow, okay? Another thing that I want to preface this before we dial in on today's uh, initial meditation is also this word creation is pretty tricky uh, because it actually doesn't cannotate anything that we think that it means. Like sometimes when we think of creation, we think of the first time something has come into existence and it, that it itself is a it's a very paradoxical word that's why they say this the serpent speaks with a forked tongue and what this means is it's like a yes and a no and this is because if we over define the word creation we miss entirely our power and who we are and what we're really about and what we can be and what we've always been and this is how, because when we say creation, we're talking about like on this side of things, which is the world of division, as we know, we've talked about this. The first time something starts in the world of division, that is called creation. But this also gets confused for like the first time things started forever, ever in infinity. And that doesn't exist. And we're going to dig into that a little bit today about just why we're working on the process of being able to, I can't even use the word comprehend, but be aware of, of um, or to prepare ourselves for that type of experience. You can't even articulate it in this world about what it's really about. So creation is the beginning of what happens in the external realm, but what happened before that, there is no before that. There is no beginning to that. And that's that just destroys the mind because the mind's always looking for an anchor point. It's always looking for a, a beginning, an explanation, and it just doesn't get one with that. And so it often rejects it. But this is how you can know. If I say, and I've talked about this before, that I created my child, like I, my child, Ara, if I, cre I say I created her, right? And I do that with the air like, yeah, and, you know, I'm the one that brought her into existence, I'm actually not correct in that. Why? Because what about the blood? What about the cells? What about the DNA? What about the bone marrow? What about the chemicals? 
What about all of those other things that are equally as a part and if not more superior than my process of creation, but that are not held accountable or are, are not actually uh, mentioned at all? Wouldn't oxygen be more of the parent of or the creator of my child even than I am because of the level of that element and its ability to fill all of the children? So what I'm getting at here is, is that we can get lost at times with these ideas that come about with these words, especially when they get misinterpreted. And misinterpretations happen all the time. And when it's going on gradually, we sometimes miss the true power and the true essence of who we are. For instance, here's another example. People have now come to know the archons as external or even uh, the gods as external. However, everything points to that these are things that actually exist internally in our consciousness. However, we can see clearly that there would be like a point where we would be aware of that. Like we would know that every single thing would be inside of us, right? And then something like a pole shift would happen and then all of a sudden or gradually we would assume that now all that stuff is outside of us. But truly, it starts within, and it even comes from a place that we just call the unbegotten. And this is actually the journey. This is actually the path. It's actually going from the created or the known to the unbegotten and the unknown. And this is why it takes a lot of trust in oneself, not trust in things externally. Because as you're going through the process of figuring out and, and being aware and feeling into how to let go of ID. In that process, it's so intrinsic for you. Nobody can come and take you through a process of letting go of ID. You would just be afraid at times. You would, you would feel like this is not the time for this to happen for me. You would feel like all that stuff because this is personal. This is something that is just needs to happen within you and all the changes can only be felt within you. That also means that all these external ideas of that I'm going to turn on these chakras, for instance, and then I'm going to go out into the world and fly in, in the Dodger Stadium and let them see my power, all of that is really the foolishness because the power, first of all, only needs to be experienced within. And generally, even just like in, um, when you're getting a taste, which is like on psychoactive substances, you get this taste of being you know, this powerful being, right? If somebody is right next to you, generally they can't feel what you're experiencing. You would assume they can. You know, if you force it on them enough, they'll tell you, they, yeah, I feel you, I feel you, you're powerful. But they're not feeling the exact way that you're feeling. You know, you may feel like you just got, you know, 20,000 volts, you know, pushed through your chakra centers. And then you say, you feel that? And unless they've taken the substance, because that's why some just don't take it and they hold the space so that they're not in that same frequency that you're in. So this just means, again, that this is something personal. This is about you going into your development. And that's why the meditations and the clearing the space is so important for you to do. Because then what happens is it's like you put the one before the zero. And we've, we've talked about this before. It's like you kind of get started on the wrong foot, even though things are still based on these two different integers at times, good, bad, good, bad, and then one floating point, which is neutral. Have you ever been in dealing with something and you just felt like you can't get a hold of your mind? It's like you're even saying things before you even are able to think about them, about what you're saying. It's like you're being rushed and you can't get caught up to your life experience. Some people actually live life like that. They feel like that before they even get settled into their current experience and get used to that, another experience is here before they can even deal with the last situation that they just got out of, now here's another situation. So this is why this power of the meditation instilling the consciousness is really important because it allows you to begin to learn how to slow the entire creation, the whole, that's the creation we're talking about, to slow the entire creation down, to literally stop what most people perceive as time in order to give yourself a, a, a really strong dose of infinity, which is what you're going to need to fully come to the process of realizing what it takes to deal with what it's some call nirvana, which we're going to be talking about today and just answering uh, certain questions. Also, 
We are going to be returning to answering questions, and I do have a lineup of about 13, 14 questions today um, that have been a synthesis of all the questions that have been asked. Now, we want to have you continue to you know, bring your questions, but it's also important to, if you just join, to listen to the past episodes. We're not going anywhere. This is an infinite journey for all of us, so... Giving yourself the time, especially if you just jumped in like last episode and then now you have tons of questions about something, we've probably answered those questions already. And uh, so it's important to go to the beginning, Podcast Secret Energy number one, and listen to what's being transmitted and then listen to the questions that are being answered and then you will start formulating your own picture of the answer to your own question, even if it hasn't been answered before. Also remember, we are very powerful and advanced beings. We're just now coming into terms and into realization of what that is really even about and what that means. One of your powers and abilities is, is that you can actually know everything that I know from the vibration of my voice, not what I'm saying in English, meaning that there's a power and ability that we have that we can sample the vibration of a person through their voice and actually gain a direct link to what they know. And I'm explaining this to you that you can do this because this becomes very similar to like lucid dreaming. If you don't really even know that you can lucid dream, then you're kind of locked out of it and you never are able to do it. And then when you find out about it, I can con you can control your dreams. This is not like some mystical phenomenon that only a few people can accomplish. There's many people who have gained control over their dreams, and you can do this. Then you'll start finding yourself maybe having your first lucid dream. So this is the same thing, in that same category of knowledge and, and awareness, that you can listen to a first person's voice, and if you dial in deep enough and, and don't get distracted, and have a really good grip on your consciousness and what it's capable of doing, then you're actually able to extract a level, you're able to also extract exactly what you need to, to know. And you're also able to extract things that are not necessarily even mentioned, okay, because of the, either the context of the conversation or, you know, just that we can't cram all of this knowledge into a one hour or two hour presentation. So I do this. Like when I listen to many of the teachers that we have out here now and I listen to what they're saying, the first thing I do is I jump on their frequency with what their, their tones and their vibration. Why? Because right now the tone and the vibration of my voice may sound the same to you from like the last show, but it has changed a bit. It's almost unintelligible because the ears are only capable of picking up a certain frequency. The third ear, of course, can do subsonics. And it can do a lot of other things. But you may not hear the change in the variable of my voice, but that change has come because of the things that I've learned, what I've experienced, and all of that that's gone on between the last time that I sent a transmission. And so it's there. It's like a, a new way, if you may, but it's an ancient way of being able to assess a great deal of knowledge and wisdom in a fraction of the seconds. Okay. So as we take this moment, we're going to go ahead and dial in into the space. And the reason why we do this is because we've learned that there is a specific algorithm to the planet. This is what I call it. It's an algorithm to this cosmos. There's a sequence in the order of creation. We started eneology this week, and we talked deeply about that uh, in our introduction to eneology. And we talk about how the order of creation was the most treasured thing for the adept because in knowing the order of things, then first you knew how not to make certain mistakes. And then you also knew how to pinpoint when certain things were occurring and where that was even coming from. So there was an unlimited amount of knowledge that you could gain and wisdom that you can gain in application from just knowing the sequence to how the creation came into play and through what order. We have the specific numbers as we talk about that mayat is akin to math. It is the same word, and it is exact. It is perfect, and that this knowledge was one of the levels of superior knowledge on the planet that had been passed to us from our ancestors. And this knowledge actually utilizes numbers not for just counting money 
or counting one's possessions, which was always seen as, as taboo. In the ancient cultures, you never counted your camels. It was seen as bad luck. You could gather, you know, I, there, there's, I don't know, 40 or so, but you would never try to count things exact or use numbers to count because it was known as something profane to do since numbers were, in fact, archetypes. Numbers connect then to planets, and numbers connect to your organs, and numbers can be connected to everything in existence. Not because of there's this mathematical uh, code in phi, 3.16, and then they just go nuts on the numbers with you and make you numb with the numbers. <laughs> it's because that when you know the archetypes in front of, behind, and on the side of the numbers, then you're able to see energies and you're able to basically use a different system of summarizing what you're experiencing rather than, I guess what I'm saying here is, is that even conversation and talking is not the pr premium way to get knowledge. We would be here forever if I was trying to explain to you forever. If I was trying to explain to you something for 10,000 years in detail, we'd be here for at least 10 years trying to explain this. And this is what I, I sent across uh, just recently in one of my texts for, uh, on Instagram or whatever. But just for everybody to know, if we've been here for, let's say, millions of years, or let's even say 5,000 years, I mean, we can at least prove that that is, that is the time span at least that we've been here if we want to use time. What that means is if I'm going to explain to you 5,000 years and what's going on in detail, this is going to actually take at least 50 years. So if you are already at, let's say, 30, you would spend till 80 trying to comprehend what I'm actually saying or listen to my, the whole story that I'm trying to give you, and that wouldn't even equate to you putting it into application. So what I'm saying is language is actually, you know, it's great for the form of communication we're using now because we have to, but it is actually one of the most primitive ways to communicate. You can always compress ideals within archetypes and symbols, and that's what numbers also are. They are symbols. Like one is a straight line for the sun because it is a beam. The sun sends out a beam or a ray, and it is the only thing that is straight in a curved reality. So these archetypes lend to us a different level of awareness, just like the number two has that curve on it, and when you start tapping into things from that way and then you realize how that replicates within the entire reality, that's when you gain, let's say, like this master code. And then this master code allows you to summarize everything going on in the experience within seconds, within minutes versus lifetimes. OK. So we dial into this code one, two, nine, five, three, six, eight. And this is because uh, this is the days of the week. We have Sunday coming in at number one. We have Monday coming in at number two. And we have then Tuesday coming in at number nine. And then we have Wednesday coming in at number five. We have Thursday coming in at number three. And we have number six coming in on Friday. And we have number eight coming in on Saturday. Okay. And so that's the sun. That's the moon. That's Mars, and then there's Mercury, and then there's Jupiter, and then there's Venus, and then there's Saturn. And without getting caught up into all of the external dogmatic traditions around these planets, which are numerous, as numerous as the humans, because they, these are just organs, so the stories are going to be just as intrinsic as all the different types of experience that a variety of the humans have here on the planet. And then, of course, you have four and seven, which we haven't talked as much about, but we do bring awareness to that there's only nine numbers here and that there's two more, and that's four and seven. And these numbers are often hidden, meaning they're, they're very occult-related because from my deciphering and awareness and experience, I'm seeing that the numbers four and seven are more related to Leviathan or what is called Leviathan in the Gnostic text. And this is what some also refer to as Ouroboros. But it is basically the great dragon or serpent that is surrounding the entire enclosure. So I think even the flat earthers will agree about this, that the planets are actually inside of the, inside of the vault or inside of the enclosure. But then the sky, as you know it, is known as Leviathan, which is covering from the top all the way to the bottom and surrounding the entire space like a womb. And the reason why these two numbers, one is four, that's the head of the dragon, and then seven is the body of the dragon, it 
plays such a vital role and it's always been been cannotated as the moon and it's because that there is basically this Wittershins or diesel, this dark or light, this good or bad or yin or yang aspect to everything. So even if we say that since everything is under this influence of what you're seeing now in this space, that's why Earth is not on this chart of planets because it's like you're in it. So there's no need to actually find a place for it. You understand? So what happens is, is that if you take, let's say, even, uh, I don't know, let's take a planet like Mercury, right? And you got a Mercury on the planet, right? This is a number five. This is anybody whose uh, uh, day of birth, let's say, is the 14th. One plus four is five. Is the fifth or the, uh, let's say, the um, 23rd. Any of those days of birth, it puts them onto this path of being a number five. However, just because they're number five in their Mercury, it doesn't mean that they won't come under the influence of what can be seen as the full moon and the new moon. So just, just say this from your own personal perspective. During full moon, your attitude can be like one way. And then during new moon, that attitude will shift and be another way. And this happens for all of us. So this has always been known as, again, this is the number four and seven, but this is, again, the numbers that many of the, especially in Western occultism, have attempted to master because these numbers really master over everything. They kind of determine, you know, yeah, you may be bright like the sun, but are you amplified or are you degenerated? Are you yin or are you yang and of course, this is what puts us all through the motions. This is what creates the seasons. This is what creates the varieties. Okay, so that's what these two numbers mean. So we're going to take a moment. And I do have some incense uh, going here or some, uh, some resins happening uh, in the space. And this is also a time for that if you have, you know, your sage or your Palo, Palo Santo that you can light it up. And the reason why we do this is because actually we do want to, I don't know if I use the term run away, but for people who are not used to doing this kind of thing or bored by this kind of thing and don't understand the value of it and are looking for something else, it's good to let them pass on to wherever they're going to go next, like whatever YouTube page they're going to hop onto next to get that immediate gratification. It's like a sugar fix for occultism. So they can go and get that. Because they're still going to end up here anyway at some point in relation to if they really want to grow their being. Not my being. You see what I mean? It's like, I'm not here for you to grow my being. <laughs> you see what I mean? That's my own personal responsibility. So two, it should be the same thing for you that you are here to grow your being and that is your first priority and you're learning the methods and the techniques in which to do that because I'm allowing my diary, as I call it, to be open to you of something that I have to also go through and something that I also have to do. And because the human body is very high maintenance, it's like a high maintenance female. It is, really. It's flesh, right? So because it's so high maintenance, this means that I always have to do this check and balance system with myself every single day. Balance is not something that you just achieve and that's it. Balance, especially in what I explained to you before about the Wittershins and the Deedles, the, the new moon, the full moon, the yin and the yang, the balance has to constantly be recalibrated. That's why you're an alchemist. That's why you're a mathematician. So you have to be able to know, and you can predict the future. You can know what's going to come tomorrow and what energies are going to be present. All of this stuff is known. It's already written, literally. You know, sometimes they make that statement, it is written, and it sounds like, oh, man, that's so mystical. But no, it's literal. It's written in the sky that how we are even brought about and what influences we go through are already scripted. But there is a space that we're going to go to where there is no script and this is the preparation for going into that space, getting yourself prepared for the release, okay? And so just remember, there's no rush. You have infinity. Some will take lifetimes to do it. Some will do this, this life, right? Some have done it already and just waiting on their orbital exit. 
So we take a moment and we dial in first to the number one. Now, also, I have to paraphrase all of this because someone will say, well, how do you know? Right. And that's why we, we love to lean on Mayat for that, because, you know, Mayat is a, a higher stage of knowing. It is a sequence of things that lets you know, OK, this is on point. So I want you, if you have your pen and paper right now, to take the numbers one, two, nine. I'll say it slow. One, two, nine. And write these numbers down. One, two, nine, five, three, six, eight. Okay, I'll take a moment. If you need to grab your calculator, unless you're really good at math, you can probably type in calc on any computer search box that you're on, and it'll pull up the calculator. All right. Like I said, this is the breathing in today. So you take one plus two plus nine plus five plus three plus six plus eight. And what do you get? So Mike, could type it in the chat box just to make sure that we on point. When you add all that together, what do you get? And I know that stream has to take a moment to catch up. <laughs> One, two, nine, five, three, six, eight gives you 34. And of course, three plus four is seven. Okay, so that's our seven days of the week. So this will let you know also that this is not a haphazard creation. If it was haphazard, meaning that it was a mistake, it wasn't supposed to happen, it comes back void. And what that means is that it aborts. It never comes into fruition. It never happens. You never reach a stage of awareness. This reality is, like they say, and, and it was good. <laughs> when they make that statement, and it is good, and it did not come back void. This means that, okay, we figured out a sequence, and it's working. Let's not reinvent the wheel here. Okay, now I'm going to go even further today. Now add from with the number 34, add the number 4. So this is 34 plus 4 plus 7. And what do you get? So this would be 1 plus 2 plus 9 plus 5 plus 3 plus 6 plus 8 plus 4 plus 7. What do you get? And I'll let that breathe for a minute for my mathematicians. So obviously, from that, and I'm just going to wait for that first text so I can even see what the lag is on the chat over here. All right, some are going to. All right. So, uh, all right. So, yeah, I guess the lag on the chat is even more than I expected. So, so there it is. Okay, 45. All right. So, and then 4 plus 5 is what? Is 9. So that gives you 9 numbers. So do you see here also... Well, before I get into that, so what you see here is you see mathematic perfection, but you see it actually in a clear way because, yeah, some say it's a Fibonacci. Some say it's the golden ratio. It's the golden mean. But if you flunked out of math, all of that is like, oh, oh shit, fractions? No. Algebra? No. <laughs> right? So this is just a very practical way of understanding that there is archetypes. Don't use this for like you're trying to add up math and money, but there are archetypes with the creation that allow the creation to be perfect. The perfect nine. Now, nine has these weird phenomena with it, which you're already aware of, right? So anything that you times by nine equals a uh, derivative of nine, right? So nine times two is 18, one plus eight is nine, right? Nine times three is 27, nine, uh, uh, two, two plus seven is nine, right? So you've seen that ph phenomenon. Nine times nine is 81, eight, eight plus one is nine. But another phenomenon that's actually missed is actually what happens to numbers when you add any number from one to nine, when you add nine to it, it reflects itself. So as an example, nine plus three right, is 12. 1 plus 2 is 3. Hmm. 
9 plus 4 is what? 13. 1 plus 3 is 4. Okay? So energetically, this is what ancient knowledge is really about, is that you feel this, you get this essence like, okay, well, you're saying that this power mirrors back anything that comes to it. So it's almost like being, it's almost like it can turn you back anyway in addition that it can make you only see yourself when you're working with the addition side of it. So this is when you go into, I'll call this the guided meditation with yourself. This means that you're literally just, you know, you're there and you're thinking about some stuff and this stuff is taking you in deeper. This is the kind, that's a guided meditation. It's not meditation, but it's the guided meditation. The meditation, you're not doing anything. It is so difficult to really meditate. And I'm saying it's difficult as not trying to put a hurdle or a stumbling block in front of you, but not to, uh, to allow meditation to be what it truly is, to hit the medium or the center space of self. You cannot be doing anything. The mind must be still. And when you think of Tibetan masters, Dojin masters, Bodhisattvas, and all of that, all they've done is been able to achieve this state. But it shouldn't be seen as a light matter, meaning that something that is so easy to do. To make your mind still and not even ask you the question, are you, did you not think? Or are we okay? You know, it, 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 I'm, I'm ready to get up. My, my leg hurts. Or I think the music's turning off. I don't like that track. Is he done yet? All of those different things that go on and meditate that in, in, in our process of trying to reach meditation are, is not meditation. But then the guided meditation, which we've become very fond of, is when someone is talking or even your mind is talking and you're trying to get into a deeper aspect of yourself, okay? So utilizing numbers and understanding their planetary uh, um, archetypical natures and then connecting that in with your body, which it is already there, opens up a real world for you, of some facts, because this doesn't allow you to lean on others' understanding. You can lean on your own. All right. So now that we go through, now that we understand that, we can now go into this guided meditation of clearing the space within ourselves and getting ourselves aligned properly. You know, this is something that you can do on your own. This is something that you can do at any point in time. And when you know this sequence, like we're making this readily available, you don't have to join Enneology to know this, even though you'll learn many things in Enneology that we haven't had the time and the opportunity to write in other places. You already have cosmic energy, which uh, I think the little bot is sharing the link to the cosmic energy. And those same numbers in cosmic energy, and we're still going to put four and seven in there with the correspondences, but those same numbers that you see in cosmic energy is exactly what we're talking about right now. So you're then able to see the planet. You're able to see all the correspondences. You're able to see the colors. You're able to see the frequencies. So you have all these components now. There's no paywall there separating you from this. The only thing that is separating you is yourself and the time that you're going to need to spend to dial into self. So that's why in a very stimulated reality, it's like, you know, I even have it happen to me from time to time. It's like I go from here and I go and do this and I go and do this and I go and do that. And then the day is over with and I haven't spent much time on self. Now, I have this benefit, though, because I actually do things in the realm of consciousness. So generally, whatever I'm even doing is going to be related to consciousness. But let's just imagine I just, you know, I worked at the auto parts store. So a lot of my time is going to be spent on dealing with that. And at the end of the day, I'm going to probably want to break. I'm not going to want to go into learning deep knowledge about myself, right? So you have to train yourself for this type of habit of spending time to go through these sequences. And like I say, know it like the back of your hand, right? So know this knowledge. Like, so when I, like flashcards, if you're thinking about, you know, creating games for children, you know, we're still working on that. But if you want to do that already in your own space, you know, create these flashcards. Boom, number nine, what is that? And then the child, that, 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 that's Mars. You know, and then letting the child know, you know, this is, the, this is your path, you know, and the path that the energy that you're working with, right? And so even for you as an adult, one, two, nine, five, three, six, eight, you should know those planets that correspond to that and you should know their story. That's another part that is going on inside of Ambassador Training Now where we have meditations 
that are already done in there to dial you into the metaphysical aspect of what these numbers mean. Because there's a physical, there's a way that this can apply to your life, your business, your relationships, all that kind of stuff. The external, if you may, and internal. I won't just limit that to external, but that, you know, your life. And then there's these parts of it that apply even deeper. The metaphysical aspects, the things that are harder to articulate. Meta in itself meaning not able to be or barely able to be articulated through a lexicon, through language. OK, so as we dial in, we start off at Sunday and we find that Sunday in itself is a synthesis. It is the seed. Also, the sun is a seed. OK, that's why it's constantly planting seeds. You see a lot of archetypical symbols around this. And this is the meditation. You can close your eyes and just, you know, see these visions, you know, use your projector, use your third eye in order to be in awareness of this, that you have that solar body within you, which is a seed. Notice that a seed contains every part of the tree, but it's not unpacked. It's not unpacked yet. So then comes two, which is the moon. And the moon, like the womb, is responsible for breaking down this potent essence of the sun into smaller morsels so that it can be digested. So this is very similar to as a child's in the belly of the mother, the mother will eat something, but that will be processed through her own alchemical system and then bought into a liquid so that way it can become nourishment for the child, okay? So that's why the moon is the division component. It divides things. But it does that so that it's able to break it down into smaller morsels for those who are not ready to take the full law and strength of the synthesis of the sun. And then it shows you literally why you should not need to rush anything because the next number is nine. It is a connotation of Mars. It is an awareness of a mediator or a peacemaker, but also a protector that in this process of what we could say is creation, since we're talking about numbers and we're talking about sequences, the next stage as this seed or as this child is being fed, these small morsels is now protection because it's now going to take time for you to grow. So this is like a farmer has to generally put a hedge around their crops or put something there to protect them. That is number nine. That's why it's not one, two, three. It's one, two, nine. Right. And so as the nine sets in and offers that protection, that's also the cherub around the garden of life, the flaming fire. This is all Mars's behavior and Mars's potential and abilities. Right. And then time will come eventually for the gestation, which brings us to the number five, which is actually Mercury. And this is because now that you gestated like a child now comes out of the womb. What's going to happen? Man, the child's going to be absorbing everything. The child is going to start speaking the language. The child is going to start writing. The child is going to start everything about even our existence because we have this mercurial component always within us. It's always about writing something down or logging something or taking a picture of something and storing something. And even the DNA moves in this kind of way. So this is your five. This is what they say, the thoth or the mercury, the one that's moving fast because the growth process is happening now. The slow process is kind of over. And then now this rapid growth is taking place based on the exposure. So then that gives you the five. And then what rolls next? Now that you're getting, now that you're absorbing, now that you're storing, now that you're learning, what occurs? And now we see where Jupiter comes into play, which is number three, the guru, right? This is the orchestrator. This is the one that knows how to use this. This is the one that's also abundant, always seen as large because there's so many things that have been gained. You can imagine it's like Mercury has been there eating all of this stuff and now it's morphing into Jupiter. This is also letting you know that there's no conflict truly between these numbers, these planets and systems. They're all derivatives of each other. They depend on the other to get to the next stage. 
So now you see Jupiter and why it's always seen as being jovial because also, and this is, of course, when it's in this perfected stage. And that's why we teach genealogy because just as it could be jovial, it could also be really grumpy. There's a yin and there's a yang. There's a four and there's a seven to each of these archetypical personalities. But we're talking about this perfect state when it doesn't come back void. Now it morphs into the number three. And then now also it is jovial. Notice how if you have a lot of things, for many people that produces more distaste. It produces more uh, uh, sadness, right? Like you get a lot of things, that means there's more things to lose. You can get attached to things. So that's what Jupiter also has to deal with in perfecting itself. The number three has to deal with that in perfecting itself. But of course, in a perfect state, as they say, in a perfect world, Jupiter is happy about all of this abundance and knows how to utilize all that abundance and knowledge. It doesn't become like, you know, you have a lot of knowledge and then, you know, now you're the guru and then now it's just it's tearing you apart because, you, you know, you can't master or handle just having that much energy and power. OK. And then as it keeps metamorphosizing, this creation must keep replicating itself. That's why it, 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 this cannot stop this process. Something has to encourage us to keep going. Something has to be steadfast and faithful in the process. And this is, of course, our number six, which is Venus. You know, Venus is, is, is always seen as uh, being the most dedicated. It's like the woman that's with you no matter what happens to you. Now, remember, there's, a, there's another side to this. There's another side to that energy. You know, there are women that don't stick with anyone. We'll leave. We'll betray. We'll do all of that. We'll share themselves with everyone. So that is when the Venus is out of balance, but in a perfect world. She's an allegiance. She's an allegiant. This is even why there are 51 or 50 uh, pentagrams on the flag in the moment, which is a symbol. The pentagram is a symbol of Venus. And then when they put the right hand over the heart, they say, I pledge allegiance. Because, of course, Venus is the symbol of the heart. It is double phi. Okay? For the phi symbol, it's shaped like a six. You put them together, it looks like a heart. Okay? And also, as far as the chakras are concerned, Venus is known as the heart chakra. Okay? So you put your right hand over your heart and you pledge allegiance. Okay? I'm with you. We're with each other. This is that energy. Okay? And the reason why that's done is because that actually brings the dedication. That brings the passion. There's so many things that kick off in the world because of the abundance. That brings all of that into play. But this looks like a huge party going on at this point. You know, you got Jupiter in there. You know, you have, you know, Mercury, you know, moving around fast. And you got all this going on. So there needs to be what in this story? A check and balance system. It can't just run amok. There must be some hedging there must be some rules. There needs to be some order in all of this. Order in the court. Who is that? What, what is the court, first of all? The court is the group of all of the numbers. Who's bringing order to the court other than Saturn? Number eight. That's why that is. Some people, they this it's Saturnalia, and they, they all worship Satan, and they just go on with their own story. And they're just making themselves evil because this exists within all of us. So if your only definition of Saturn is that it's an evil planet, you missed it. You're on the surface again. You're just on the snake's face. You didn't go deep into the womb. So it brings us to that eight sets the boundary. Just like you see how the water stops at the shore. If it keeps going, it overruns the forest. Just like you see in a farm that there's the hedging that has to happen. Like somebody has to put the check down or else the weeds just grow up on everything. You even have like plants that will grow up over other plants and just like, this, I'm, I'm going to be in, <laughs> needs more of me. So there must be a check and a balance system within the Netaru. That's Saturn. Okay. And that's why most people, they don't like to see Saturn coming because it always means someone is going to get checked. Something, that's why there's the, the re, the re, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, scythe in the hand is a farming tool. A lot of people look at that man and they just look at the whole picture and they're just like, oh my goodness, I'm, ah, run. It's a farming tool. It's for one to 
denote, okay, this is going to happen over here. Okay, you can't, you can't do this or you're going to stop this from even being able to grow. So something has to be able to do that. And, of course, this is why most people don't feel that, you know, especially the neophytes, they don't feel generally that uh, happy about what Saturn is doing most of the time. <laughs> You know, and then, of course, there's the false representatives of these energies that try to emulate certain parts of their characteristics, right? But this is, in a perfect world, how things truly work. And then what surrounds that entire thing, as we talked about, is the four and the seven. The four being the head split from the body. The, that's the maverick, right? That's the one that feels unique. That's the one that tries to introduce the uniqueness. And then you have the seven, which is a dynamo, just all pure energy, always on the go, always got something to do, always got a place to be, always like, just like that. And that's the entire creation. So now that we've dialed in properly and now that you're feeling more comfortable in yourself about your experience here, now we're going to go into some of the questions that we have for today and uh, we're going to see if we're going to do a little rapid fire so we can move through this. But based on what I've already said in this precursor of the conversation, this will actually allow you to become aware of so many different things about yourself. And you'll even be able to answer these questions better than I'm answering them right now. Like I may be in a certain mood, a certain zone, but when you are armed with these powerful archetypes, archetypical energies within yourself, you can answer any question because you know where the energy is coming from. Likewise, when something is off, and this is why it's important to learn enneology, when something is off or imbalanced, you know what component to bring in to balance it. When there's a fire, you don't throw lighter fluid on it. But many of us do that in everyday life. Like we get into a communicative issue and we'll be communicating with someone that we need to learn how that planet or how that energy communicates. But then if we go in with our same old method of how we communicate with things, then we're not going to get the response that we're looking for. And this is why it's so imperative, especially if you're developing or designing or doing things to learn these archetypes, because you cannot reinvent the wheel. This is the sequence and it rolls with nature. It rolls with everything around us. So it looks like we're still on point here. All right, here we go. We continue in here. So this first question is, what is the most direct way of getting out of depression and healing one's heart? Now, what I did also today is I, I put questions together that actually all have the same answer as far as them being relative to each other. And so we're actually by the end of this episode, caught up with all of the questions, except for the ones that come through today. So again, this question is, is that what is the most direct way of getting out of depression and healing one's heart before you went on a hundred or so DMT journeys when you were taking the front door and became lucid, balancing your chakras, etc. what did you see? Again, we're, there's a few questions here. There's three. And then the final question is, I would love to hear you speak on nirvana, okay? Now, all of those questions are related, okay? And I'm going to explain to you, first of all, when I was able to continuously go through the front door before I started using any kind of substances, which I haven't in a, quite a bit of time. I was using breathing. Breathing was my first way into all of what I was exploring with myself when I was going into these other stages of self. Someone is asking, what did I see? Nothing. The real nothing. See, we think that nothing is like even something. It's like an absence of something. But nothing, it can't even be described really. So I'm going to try to bring you into this view because I also want to address this question. What is the most direct way of dealing with depression and healing one's heart? See, I noticed that there is this technique that we're continuously using in the process of healing to work ourselves through the pain. Okay. And while the world has constantly used this, this method, even psychologists use this kind of method, I present possibly another way, 
something that you can add to what is already here. I'm not taking anything away, but I present that we change our minds a bit as a mastermind about what you're really experiencing when you think you're going through depression or you think that you've been hurt, okay? By allowing you to first ask yourself the question, what if you could not feel anymore? Because all of these are, are all yin-yang components, so to hate is indeed to know love. To be sad is indeed to know happiness. No matter how much you want to argue with it, no matter how much you want to neophyte out, be a baby about it, you want to find a planet that exists with only love because you just want to be loved in that energy for that, you know, you just want to be loved. But then somebody loving you for two weeks on, without end, and then now you don't like that no more. Now you just, you know, you, you, know it, you get turned off by it. Because we have a yin and yang thing. We have a four and a seven happening here. So even based on the new, the new moon may come through. And that same thing you loved, you now hate. You want them to leave out of the house and get away from you and all this. And your mood swings. Okay? So instead of trying to separate all, all these different emotions and figuring out how to get the ones that we prefer... Why don't we test ourselves for one moment and say, what if you couldn't feel any of them? And of course, there would be a large majority of us here that would be like, man, you mean I wouldn't love pet Snooky anymore? I wouldn't love my, my mom and my girlfriend or my, my, my wife, my husband. I wouldn't love my children anymore. Mm -hmm. I, ain't, I can't let that go. Right. And that, that would be the response. But yet. Some have not necessarily seen or been able to comprehend that that is nirvana. No elements have any more effect on you because now nothing exists anymore. There's no floor. There's no happiness. There's no sadness. And this is something that we have to get prepared for. It's not happening now. That's why I was saying that fools rush in. <laughs> you know, enjoy your life, your sadness and your happiness. Because when you don't have any governors anymore, when you no longer have Netaru, when you no longer have organs, you cannot feel any of this anyway. So no matter how much someone tries to get you into it, to get you happy or upset, you can go into neither when you reach nirvana. That's why it's generally the last stage of a person's existence. Like once you reach that stage, you're, you're not even going to be on the planet. It's, you're already sent a signal to the body that it's, you're ready to gestate. I'm ready to metamorph. Now I, I got it. I got the full palette of love, hate, joy, uh, 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 richness, you know, integrity, thievery. I got it all. And now the king in the pond must go back in the same box and I'm ready to experience the unknown. See, those who are looking for another world that they're going to be able to predict what's going to happen there, you're just going to go into another creative. You're going to go into another creation. And there's nothing wrong with that. But there are some that are actually seeking to go beyond the creations to actually go into the infinite immortal field. And in there, the only way that was able to maintain and sustain itself that way is that the things that you're calling hatred and the things that you're calling joy and love do not exist there. The things that you're calling human bodies and animals and souls and spirits and all these different divis divisive forms that you've created in the created world don't exist there. And if you believe that it does, you are mistaken. Because if it existed there, then that would become just like this. And there would, be no, there would be no reason or importance or use for something like that. There is only two spaces. There's the worlds of division. And then there's the, 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 the whatever you want to call it. It can't be put into a name that does not have all of that going on. And you may say, right now and this is kind of how you know where your growth is at you may say right now well shoot i don't know if i want to exist in a place that's without love that sounds like this like and i can't feel anything that sounds like a robot <laughs> right that shows you how far you're away from opening up the door that you don't know what's on the other side okay and this would happen to me even in the lucid dreams that I was given something, a choice first, that I would know what the experience was going to be. It would always appear as a very beautiful woman, like bad, like shut it down, like an 11. 
And I can either go run off with her and experience all the pleasures of that, or I could go, be, be, go, on, go through dingy number two door, which was always depicted and shaped and looked in a way that was not appealing. Almost to, like I said, when nine reflects itself back to you to encourage you, just go off, go run off with her. You know what's going to happen. That's the known. You're going to experience the pleasures and the joy of being with her. Or you could take door number two, and we can't tell you what's going to happen in there. Who knows? And I can't say I took door number two every time. I'm not going to front with you here. But when I took door number two, and this would always happen in lucid dreaming, when I took door number two, I can't even articulate to you the type of experiences I would be having in door number two. And you would think that I would always go to door number two. And that wasn't the case either. Sometimes I'd just be like, man, I'm going with the known. And then other times, especially when I was fed up with what was ever happening in my environment, like, man, I got to get out of here. I got to leave here. Then door number two seemed to be more appealing. Okay? So this is what we're talking about here with spiritual growth in the past. Nirvana is ultimately a stage of unknown because you load a whole different set of awareness and being and all that that you're that's foreign to this place. And then so when you're asking yourself, what is the greatest way to get out of depression and, and, and healing your heart is to realize that at least you can be depressed. <laughs> at least you have a heart that needs to be healed. Check yourself first to understand the value of what you already have. And then you can move on from there and start restoring happiness and then healing your heart because you'll realize that all oh, this is basically your choice. And without the depression and without the broken heart, there is no mended heart and there is no happiness. And you can lose the ideas of the neophyte that you can, like a, a buffet, only pick out the ones of the happiness and the joy and the riches and the pleasures and all that that you want without somehow accruing or gaining the attention of those opposing forces that are equally mated to that. And this is, again, sometimes what we hate about ourselves. That's why maximum knowledge pulls you out of self-hatred, which is a part of depression. Because you start even being able to pinpoint, it's like, let's not try to sit here and do this through a conversation. If I'm feeling a certain way, like, so what do I got a problem with? Is it my heart? Oh, well, that's Venus. So then I go to day number six and for, or excuse me, day number eight, or excuse me, you go to day number six and then or they're intrinsically linked together, but you would go to day number six and then you would find those correspondences of the things that you need to begin to mend that energy and resonate that energy properly. The right colors, the right sounds, the tones, the foods, the, the uh, environment and all that's there in cosmic energy. Right. And you would bring that element back into balance, but you would know that it was that element. And that's the power of what you receive through this level of wisdom. You know, OK, if I'm experiencing this, this is more or less the planet that it's coming from. And then you're also able to see what planets are aids to it versus enemies, meaning that there are certain things that can only instigate the problem. And this is like, you know, you're feeling depressed. And if you bring in, let's say, number eight. Eight is going to just tell you to suck it up already in that because eight's used to dealing with pain and can, can handle pain very well. So it's not like, so, oh, number six, get yourself together. It's more like pfft, you haven't experienced anything. So that is generally sometimes seen to be an enemy, not as if they're fighting or conflicting. It is just that this is not going to produce the most ideal situation. Versus if the six then goes to number two, which is always giving, always nourishing like a mother, it may then find in that number two the levels of, uh, of repair that it needs to come out of the broken heart phase. So do you see what I mean? That, that, that's how this works. This is alchemy. All right? So now you get that it's all a gift to even be depressed. <laughs> and when you start seeing it that way, it starts to remove depression. All right, so let's see what else we got here on just this answer. Exactly, so that is it. Just on that, answering those three questions. And it's also, remember, and if there's not this other place, because I told you before, there's, there's, 
It's not going to be, it's either, you know, the division and the creation or the totality, right? So even when we're talking about ascension, and this is why there became gods, okay? This is why there is chakras, okay? This is why there is planetary energies, but it's all inside. So where earth got led astray, which is the human being, where we got led astray is we started trying to appeal to things externally. Now, because you climb the ladder of lights in the order in the magnitude, which we pre presented in the algorithm, you're climbing the ladder of lights. So you start the sun and the moon. And, and in this process, you're leveling up. This is self-worship, okay? In this leveling up process, there's a lot of encouragement going on with this because every time you level up, you gain another power or sida. You don't want to rush because if you turn on the wrong power at the wrong time or you're too much and all of that, it, you just blow it for yourself. So it becomes like dominoes and you're stacking these dominoes and you don't want to like rush stacking a domino and knock all the rest of the dominoes down. That's, that's what the adept knows, Right? So in this process of, of basically building these powers and the energies to yourself, this is called ascension. You're climbing this ladder. So do you see why it would make no sense to try to do this with external gods that, that you would be serving? It, it would destroy this whole idea of ascension. What would you do? You would ascend to go and serve another god? How does that even work? Especially since most of them are not, or things that say that they're gods, they're not even visible. They don't even, you don't even really talk to them. They don't even really come around. This is why this all has to be done within, and this is why it's facts. There's clear proof that this is all going on within because it doesn't even make sense externally. So you would, like, climb up higher to serve another god? I just as soon as serve the god that I'm serving now. It doesn't make any sense. But if you look at it in the true context and it says, well, once you graduate root chakra, you can stand on it. It's a foundation. And then this allows you to reach into the next world. And then as you're climbing this ladder of lights or Mount Maru, you're also going through these experiences that open your eyes because these planets are eyes into a greater stage of awareness. And then once you open that final eye, and all your eyes become whole, then you wormhole, you quirk. You basically go to nirvana, as they stated it as a thing, because in all those processes, you're having the full-on thing. You're, you're, you're going through all of the experiences, and then you learn, you become wise. That's why they show those old Chinese guys with a long beard. You know, he's becoming wise, and then he moves on to the next stage, and that's how even the ancient paintings are. But through all of this, and that's why you can't say even now that, oh, I don't want to go to nirvana. I don't want to go to a place with no emotion. I don't want to. You, you can't even judge it like that until you go through each experience and then realize once you're full, okay, now I'm ready. Do you see what I mean? That's why you, you don't want to rush with this. You don't want to get it out of order. You don't want to kneel fight out on this kind of stuff. All right, so that answers that question. This next question is, what do you think about Bufo and, and Ayahuasca? Okay. Now, first of all, these are very powerful elements. So, you know, one should always be cautious of how they speak about things that are on this level of magnitude. Bufo and Ayahuasca have changed lives. Right? But the question here is, is it Bufo doing it and Ayahuasca doing it? Or is it the person doing it? Okay, meaning that when any element changes your life, is it the element that's changing your life or is it you? Now, to answer this question, I can only hearken to some people that I know that have actually gone on these journeys and they're exactly the same. True, three days a week, they were totally different. They had seen the light. Now they know that it really exists. They have tasted, although through the back door, but they've still tasted that there is for sure an, a beyond, okay? However, just like a dream, and that's why it's always important to, you know, work on the front door, work on the meditation, work on the breathing, because it removes the filters. What are the filters? The filters are, or the lenses, or the films. Okay, filters, lenses, films. That's all camera work. 
<laughs> right there. Filters, lenses, and films. It removes all of that. Because when you take a substance, there is already happening in your consciousness a marker that says, you took the substance. So this is why you're experiencing what you're experiencing. And so what this also serves is a form of protection, just like filters protect. They protect the sensor, right? And this is because when some big giant tree rolls up on you, <laughs> face and all and full on moving or, you know, God forbid you took a look at the sun when your third eye is open. If that runs up on you and you don't have a reference point that you took a substance it, it will strip you. This is why generally people who are given substances and don't know about it and go into trips never come back from those trips. They call it too many 16ths. They didn't know it was a Mickey. They didn't know it was slipped on them. And then all of a sudden they start seeing things different. They trip and then they, they lose it. And they never come back because they don't have a reference point that, I, yo, I took something because it was slipped on them. But with that reference point, no matter how crazy the journey gets, you have a reference point. This is time travel, astral travel, whatever you want to call it. So you already set a marker for your consciousness. Look, when, it's, when you get control again, go back there, right? So this is why the person's able to return from the journey. So they go on this experience, and then even when they see things, they may be terrified, but not to the point sometimes that they can just go overboard. Now, there's no generalization here. Each person has a different scenario because, as you see, each person is emitting a different planetary system or number predominantly. So that's going to vary from time to time. This is not a one-size-fits-all. But this is a very sound generalization that generally, once they return, now they're changed. And it's because what they've done is they've amplified the chakras for that moment. They've given an energetic potential to the wheels. So you got some fuel, basically. And these fuels are the bioethnogens. It's because these plants, they have their own fuel supply. They have their own wireless power. Okay, that's the way you could look at it in modern times. All right, so they have their own wireless, energetic, and communicating system. And when you come along and you ingest some of that, now you partially become tied into that until your system passes it, right? But this is also leads to the phenomena, day one, day two, day three, oh, you're the saint. Now you know everything. Now you swear you're never going to turn back to, and then you have a whole list of things for yourself. But just like a dream, as the time continues and you stop either administering the medicine or figuring out ways to actually be able to create your own internal medicines and work with your own vehicles, the person starts slipping. Sometimes even they get worse than they were when they started. It happens because of addictions. Like I've seen people who go on so many ayahuasca journeys that something is kind of happening with them. It's like because you're also open during these times and just like any plant, or any other living organism, you can get contaminated. Contamination is just by alien forces. This just means something that's foreign to the body, something from another chakra that you've never even been in before. And then that gets into your field, and then it starts to kind of like throw things off balance a bit. And a lot of this stuff is happening unintelligibly, meaning the person never even really knows that this is happening. Now, three months later, this is a person that you can barely recognize talking crazy stuff and insisting things that are not true and elevating themselves onto a level of power in which they think that they have when they really don't. Many people use these elements to reign or master over others. They administer this element to other people, and especially if the person is their first time, they somehow associate the element with the person. And they, oh, my shaman. When there's lots of dark shamans, also uh, imbalanced or distorted shamans running around, utilizing the medicines in order to entrap others into their etheric fields, right? Because remember, we are spirits or we're bodies inside of our spirit. I'll say that again. We are bodies inside of our spirit. Our spirit is bigger. So when you start doing spiritual things or you start feeding the spiritual body more, it grows larger. So there are many people that have taken these kind of medicines and substances and their spiritual body is very large and it envelops another person's spiritual body. And if they are not 
honorable and integral and understand what their purpose is, they can abuse that. There's always a test. They may even start it, uh, they may not have even started off with the intentions to do that. But having three or four fawning princesses around you telling you that you are the gift of the God for them and that they saw you as the great snake or whatever, <laughs> this could destroy everything that you built up thus far. And that's why there's perils on the path. And we've talked about that. But it's just, again, an awareness that these substances, they don't really change anything. It's the being that changes. They invite you. There's a lot that's backwards also about the word or world. This world is backwards in many contexts because when I had my first DMT journey, the beings that I saw as I was ascending this ladder of lights, a group of the beings that I had saw as I was going, I had seen three or four nights ago in the dream. And I even made the, the statement, you're the beings that I've seen in the dream. And that dream was because then I was snatched up into another envelope or vault or space or layer <laughs> to go in and so I was just traveling fast, but I recognized I saw these beings about three days ago. And so it only confirmed once again that everything here is kind of backwards. So when you do take any of these substances, and I won't say in every case, generally the substance has called you to it for the experience because it exists in a space that is like a different cog of time and is a bit more in the future than the space that we exist in now. And this is very simple. It's because... There's an ayahuasca plant in what we would call 2060, okay? There's a lot of things in 2060. They're there right now. So what I'm getting at here is, is that you have forces that are so powerful, they're going to be here at year 3000. And because their linking system, their Wi-Fi, if you may, is crossing over the space that we call time, that's why when you plug into them, you're able to see at least a chunk or a layer of what's going to happen in certain experiences and what's going to happen in certain spaces, what's going to happen in certain times. But you can also do this in your dream. So I want this to be very clear, clear. So the next question here is, is World War III imminent? Okay, so basically, are we going, going to go through another world war? Okay. First of all, let's just say it as it is, World War III is over already. Maybe you're talking about maybe World War IV, but not World War III. World War III is over, and it's because, or has already taken place, and it's because as the wars continued, there was always from the warlords an idea of not destroying as many things, but still accomplishing the same overall purpose of war, which is just to divide. OK, so instead of tearing everything up and starting all over again, why not just accomplish what war is capable? What, what is the purpose of war without tearing everything up? That was the endeavor. So since the purpose of war was to divide, that's when TV came. Chemicals, all sorts of different devices that were experimented with, not only by the paranormal division. But also even the United States Industrial Complex. And all their psychological complexes, like, you know, the, there was more psych wards in the United States than there was churches at a certain point. So there was this period, as you see with uh, the MKUltra, et cetera, which all the documents are now published. The documents of MKUltra, which are now declassified, are so extensive, you can't even read them all. You almost just get burned out. It's like, all right, well, I know they, they, experimented on, they experimented on dogs, any other life forms, Wi-Fi, frequencies, anything they could come up with to how to change and manipulate and control and all that kind of stuff. So that research is already done. So much is done that they could declassify the whole thing and, not e and count on you not reading it. <laughs> count on somebody not even being able to OCR and optical correction, uh, optical correct the text and then actually get it into something to where somebody is able to at least search it. All of that, they're like, no, nah, they, they're going to just be overwhelmed with data once we're done. Once this internet comes, there's going to be so much knowledge out there, they ain't going to know Tit for tat, piddle from post, because they have no guideline. And it's the same thing with the body. They can be in the bodies. They can have, we can have billions of bodies. We got eight billion bodies. 
as long as they don't have a manual to the bodies, we never have to worry about anything really occurring that's that threatening for us. And this is, of course, the controllers, the kings, the shades. That's their, that's their conversation. It's over, a overload. So World War III was an overload, a desensitization, and uh, a degeneration, and uh, a division. All taking place through all these different things. Like, you like Lakers? I'm a Bulls fan. Yeah, deal with it. You like Crips? I'm a blood. You like Nicki Minaj? Cardi B. I'm more like on that Cardi B level. You see what I mean? So there's so many divisive components. Now, that was World War III. And now, what do the people do? They can't really agree with each other. It's worse than even probably in the last time that we were doing this and we destroyed the world. People are just are so disconnected because they have so many different things that appear to them to be separate when really, basically from what I've seen, it's like a 1% part of you that makes you unique. And while that's beautiful and that's your own spin, it is still a very small amount to the rest of how everything is put together. And it's only when you go deep, as we talked about earlier today, do you see these differences. And it was brought to me in the journey of skinless. That the being that was the mother, she didn't have skin. It was weird to look at. She had no hinges, no bones. It was strange to deal with for a minute. I was kind of looking over here with the third eye. <laughs> and then it was like, you know what? You can't handle me? And then she was linked in with all of the other uh, feminine forces and it was like twerk 100x <laughs> meaning that the movement of the curve was so mesmerizing that we had only began to see the power of the divine feminine with just what we see in the world with how they may show us some of the skin and show us you know some of the curves and all of that that this was on a whole nother level if you weren't careful in there, you would be a zombie. It could, it would, it would trance you. This is what trance is. It was a way that it moved that can throw you into this, and you would just be in trance, and you just stay there for a minute. So I guarded my eye, my third eye. I was like, "What am I even looking at?" And then for a moment, you know, you sit in fear, and then fear subsides, and then the conversation begins, and it just basically explains, "Look, I don't, I don't have skin." <laughs> Skin is the division. Skin is the separation. Skin is the derma. Skin is the dream. Skin is the illusion. Most have led themselves astray because of the skin. But if you pull the skin off, you'll see we all look alike. You won't even be able to really judge because that is all about everything that the skin has going on. And because of this, we're not looking deeper into our organs and figuring out their condition. We're so busy trying to figure out what's going on externally. And this is just what was being told to me. You're so busy trying to figure out what's going on externally, looking in the mirror, seeing how you look, that you can't even remember that it's your heart that is hurting and needs help. Your, your spleen is, is ruptured. And then you do things to help you look more better that are directly against things that go on inside of you that need their health and their strength. And because of this, your body is at war. The war is popping off inside of you so this is again a hearken unto world war three popping off inside of you where the tongue and the mouth just says shoot the taste buds is is in control today i don't care what this is going to do to your liver i don't care what this is going to do your spleen because i'm on top that's the mouth because i'm on top i run the show <laughs> and also the surface of the skin i'm just going to look beautiful i'm about to put all this makeup and these poisons and these toxins I'm going to spray some cologne on. If people never even peep the game. If you spray cologne on, what is that? Well, without figuring that out, because you can look at the back of the bottle and none of that stuff you can pronounce just like your, your, your uh, foods at times if they're synthetic. You spray that on here, right? Mm -hmm. Where does that go? Right into a main vein, right? And then now, how do you think that is going in your bloodstream? There's no way around this okay it's a wonder that you can't taste it but the reality is, is that once that goes into the bloodstream now you have jacar <laughs> jacar number five 
running through your system. I mean, how how is that going to work out for the rest of the organs? You know, that's hilarious. Let me take a moment here. It's just, I'm not crying because I'm sad. It's just so hilarious to think about, you know, some of the stuff that we're up to. And, and I'm not excluded. Like I said, this is a personal diary. You know, I throw some Creed on, you know, $300 a bottle back in the day, you know, smelling like, you know, you just arrived for all of the women at that point. And then, you know, you're just poisoning yourself to death and it's just layered the sickness. Okay. So this is just, again, how the body can be at war because one part of the body prefers to have something and then it's going to just totally nuke out all the other parts of the body. But after all, you don't care because it makes you beautiful. It makes you smell good. Right. So this is what we're talking about. So. So we talk about basically World War Four. Many are divided within their own opinions. So we, you get it now. And of course, well, that's World War Three. So how do we win World War Four? Because the war gods are not going to stop. It's like an incessant onslaught. They have zero chill with this kind of behavior because also still sharp and steel. So when you figure this out, you will become a greater being. So there's also no harm, no foul. Everything is basically your decision, whether you want to accept that or not. So obviously the internal unity, as I'm explaining here, bringing your bodies into an alignment and an agreement. Hey, Mr. Taste Bud, why don't we find something that's just good for you, but also good for the rest of us. And I'm sure you're smart enough, Mr. Brain, to figure that out. And then pretty soon, you have your meal in front of you. Okay? And then also, you're removing all of the external deities. People still can't let it go. It is an addiction. External deity is an addiction. It is one of the most unpronounced addictions in the world. It is probably more infectious than the opiate virus or the opiums. Right? And this is because... If you go in every single culture, they always have something external to them right there that they're worshiping and bowing down and praying to, and they're totally ignoring themselves. They're giving us food, money, and everything to all, and energy mainly, essence, belief, all the stuff that you should be giving yourself, you're already disposing of it externally. It's going in the trash, right? So how we win, how we win World War Four is by removing this external stuff and Focusing that energy back within. And then obviously, to get to then external unity, step-by-step -step process here, we then get to sustainability. Actually starting to sober out, especially for my young folks. If you're working, you're tired of working, you're tired of doing all these things because you don't have goals. Set simple goals. And don't try to accomplish something in one day. I'm going to become sovereign. And then the next day comes, you're not sovereign. Now you're pissed off. You're not sovereign. I mean, come on. You need the time and the experience, but set the goal. Okay. My goal is, and this is one of my goals. I'm going to get some land. I'm going to spend some time doing that. Figure out the place that I can get the most powers on that land. This is powers are well water, sun. That's not so much at too high of an intensity. Because remember, just because solar, power, solar panels take in sun, it doesn't mean that they want to be in the desert. They get hot. Okay, so all the powers. There's a river running there. There's another power. You can use hydroelectrics. So you find a place that has some power, and then you set your intentions to acquire that place. <clears throat> Even if you have to go and get a loan at first, at least it's not more loans for more electronics. More, more things that are just going to depreciate. Another car loan. Even if you're getting a loan for that moment, now you get that loan, and then you're going to pay off that loan as fast as possible. And then you're going to own that. And no matter what happens, you'll be surprised. Like, when you make these moves, these are the energetic updates. These are the energetic uh, uh, um, upgrades. This is how even one can pass through chakras in the as above, so below way. You could do things on the as below that raise things up in the as above. So if I become a sovereign on land, now I got my own land, watch how you feel. When the clock hits at 6 in the morning, eh, 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 you'll get up and you'll feel comfortable in the meditation. Not that, oh, my goodness, I got to be to work. I hope traffic ain't bad today on the I-85. You don't care none about all of that stuff. You'll do it at your own pace. And, of course, as you've learned from so many of these financial masters, that is the condition that you want to be in to truly create something. You want to be, you know, calm and, and, and relaxed. And in your, you know, in your skin, in your space, 
and know that you're, you're on a firm foundation, not that somebody's going to be able to yank that off from underneath you and then you're going to starve. Because that, you know, those impending things of happening may not even be realistic to be occurring, but the sub to occur, but the subconscious mind, because it wants that security, it feels like that. It's like, yo, man, we standing on somebody else's stuff. We need to get our own stuff. And then if we don't have our mentors in place to let us know, this is what you should do. Don't freak out. It's also the, these technologies. These technologies are pretty on point as far as the battery. They got a new battery. It lasts forever. <laughs> like this damn battery is impressive. They just want to put it in a car, something else that depreciates. I saw another uh, device that they released on CES 2020 where it's a smart breaker. It's not actually tied into any external networks. You can, but it also operates outside of, the, outside of any network. And what it does because it ties right into an app on your phone, is let you know how much power you're really burning, what is really burning that power, and at the push of a, a, a button, you can turn it off. It's imperative to understand this. Google themselves was able to save 70% of their power consumption by bringing this kind of thing into play to begin to do Overwatch. Judy's computer is still on. The screen is off, but the computer is on. We have a center that's sitting right in Arizona getting peltered by heat. Why don't we move it to North Dakota? It would solve the same purpose and put it closer to the backbone. So this is what they have enlisted AI also to do for them. Now their energy is down 70%. And it's not because, because they always go, because we're becoming more green and sustainable. No, because they're saving money. And they're able to take all of those resources and put it into growing their machine rather than ex expending it on just buying power and energy. But again, these kind of technologies, they're not the issue. The issue is who's using the technology and what we're using it for. So right now, since we have this advent of sustainability hitting into all of the major markets, everybody's talking about they got vegan, vegan leather. They got like vegan shoes now. I'm like, is you serious? This is a gluten-free shoe? I mean, what are we doing here? But it's because there's a trend to preserve the environment. A lot are using their time and their energy and their consciousness and, you know, their own pursuit of wealth to start creating things that actually are technologies that equal this sustainable blueprint that society is saying they want. So that'd be another part of the investment. Let me put some batteries in here. You know, let me get a system going on. They got one system you lay in the river. And because of the way it's shaped, when the water's coming down the river, it turns a turbine. It's got two cords coming out of it, and you just put the cords into the batteries, and it charges the batteries. So what I'm saying is, is that it's not as complicated as creating a nuclear power plant to get yourself sustainable on land. But it is complicated at times for one to get to the mindset that that's something that they need to begin to plan for now, even if you don't have the money to buy the land. Go find the land first. Start bringing it in. You know, people are always manifesting things. Like, I manifest another good job. Okay. <laughs> for, for what? So you can keep working? Like, if you're going to manifest that next good job, let that next good job be manifested because you're paying for this land that you already found. Because what this does is it puts you on a foundation. You know where you're going. You're not saying to yourself, well, I'm going to wait until I get the money, and then I'm going to start searching for the land. That's not the way to do it. That's backwards. You go and find the land, spend the time. You, you can go and start seeing the place. And then once you see the place that you want, now you get a motor in that tense. You get some motivation of why you're even working. Then, you know, the boss is not pissing you off anymore because then you're like, I don't even care what he says. I only have X amount of more work days to go before I acquire my land. So do you see? So you start making the moves. And they give these pointers at times in these self-help courses, but it's always skewed. They tell you, well, put yourself into the, to the uh, mindset uh, that you've already been able to achieve it, and then you'll get it. And it's like, eh, kind of. But what is it that you're trying to achieve? And is that really going to set your subconscious at ease? And those actions that you're making, there's some that you can do now physically. Go start grabbing that paper. Go to the bank. Grab the REO list and ask them, well, on the repo list, is there land you got that is coming in the repo? Oh, yeah. And then you'd be surprised. Because then as you're setting this up, because this is all happening somewhere else, too. It's all happening on another side of things. You start providing yourself the resources in order for you to be able to accomplish what you need to accomplish here. It's, omni it's an omniscient reality, omnipotent reality. But you got to meet yourself on both sides. So that's how you win a war. You eliminate the enemies.
you're on both sides now. All right, so this next question is, what is your view on longer hair increasing sensory, sensory reception? Okay, this question came up three times, so I'm not sure if it was the same person, but it really seemed like people want to know and understand what's going on with the hair. Now, you see I got my, my joint coiled up right now, so I got the coils working. It's helping me amplify the energy, but the hair is obviously storing memories, right? It can, it can store memories in essence. That was the whole thing about not cutting your hair was like using hair like a talisman that during this process of when you're learning certain things, if you grow out your hair and what you're learning, then there's a certain level of retention and a certain level of like an antenna like connection that you maintain to what you were learning or what you were absorbing. However, because there's always a yin with the yang. If you keep growing your hair long and you're going through a lot of traumas and anxieties and issues, all that's still in your hair. So there are some people who have adapted this idea that the hair is power, but they are missing some of the small details too. But yeah, if you went through a divorce during that time, if you were on drugs during that time, and all of these different things were going on with that same set of hair, you may need to hit the reboot button. <laughs> that same beard, then you may need to hit the reboot on that because also that's how I even treat my body. That I know that I, since I've come into this alignment with self, I've come into this balance, now the organs that are going to be generated within this next however long it takes for organs to generate, let's say it's seven years, this new generation of these new organs, they're going to be the ones that are the balanced organ. But the organs that I was creating during the times that I was in the most conflict, those organs are also pretty damaged at this stage and they need to be swapped out. So that's how this growth process is actually taking place. It's not as mystical sometimes as we think, which is the mist where that's not being able to see what's really happening. But we always must seek to understand both sides of things. That's why I was saying earlier before we had the last conversations, now I'm on both sides so I can actually see everything now. And that gives me way more awareness and presence of understanding what I'm experiencing. It doesn't give me just that polar, polar view. It's great. Grow your hair long. It depends on the circumstance. Some people ask me questions about weed. Is it okay to smoke weed? It all depends on who you are. It depends on what kind of reference points you're, leading, you're leaving. It depends on many things. So there's not a generalization of a one-size-fits-all. But always your body will tell you. Hey, man, you know, this is, this is throwing you off. So we'll keep going with this. The next question is, since we need balance in everything, isn't homeschooling a risky way of teaching our children? Shouldn't we, shouldn't we add to or correct what they are taught instead of removing them from the world? Okay, very great question. It's a question that has often been pondered in this house as, as we're raising children. The answer to this question is, is that let's just step back here for a moment on the intensives, on the intensives with the child and trying to figure out, you know, what needs to be done for the child at this moment and start thinking about the child based on the age range living in the future where they would be at not only the age of knowing, but that they would need to now enter into the world and fend for themselves. Okay. So if you have a five-year-old child, that would be in retrospect in about 12 years. So then you start thinking about, so what is the world going to be like in 12 years? Either the world that I'm creating, if I'm sustainable already, or the world that I'm going to have to put them into because I'm still working in the world. And then you start thinking about what is it going to be the most important for them to really know rather than, I don't know, Christopher Columbus, Santa Claus, and all the rest of the stuff they teach in a really great curriculum in school. <laughs> Not. What are they really going to need to know? Because really, the biggest issue with removing children from school is actually the camaraderie and them being able to be around other children. So that is a genuine concern. But it's not the curriculum that is exemplary. I think Vox just recently did another uh, um, great documentary about the difference between the education in the United States and the Western society versus in most other countries. 
and how what you're really learning doesn't have a tendency to be anything that you can use, especially to propel yourself forward as an entrepreneur, you would just become another worker. But moving that all aside, what is it that a child is really going to need for you to feel like that you did the best that you could to give this child a proper advantage in the reality that they're going to be going into and the time span in which they're going to enter it? My answer to that question, and that would be unique to me because this is my own answer to this question of what I apply, is one, they need to be firmly grounded into who they are. We've seen it enough, and it's happened even to us, that not having that awareness of who we are starts making us prefer others or other things that are not like us. And we try to conform and become like that because we're searching for identity. Children are searching for identity. So with something like eneology, you're capable of saying to this child, okay, you're really Mercury. I mean, you wouldn't maybe phrase it like that, but you would say, this is what you like to do. This is what you enjoy. And you would see this. You don't even have to teach a child directly like that. The best instructors actually don't let who they're instructing even know that they're being instructed. They just start building that around them. So if you know that this child is Mercury, you start bringing this child into the awareness of other languages and bringing this child into the awareness of the things that resonate with that energy. And then within a very short period of time, because it's not like you'll be teaching them anything. <laughs> you get where I'm coming from? You won't be teaching them. You will be reminding them. And then once they have firmly root, become firmly rooted and grounded into who they are, they can be anywhere. You don't have to worry about whether they're at the school or whether they're firmly rooted and grounded. They're influencing because that's what you're most concerned about is them coming under the influence of something else that is going to lead them astray. So now that they have gained their awareness and been seated into who they are, now they are going to influence. And then at that case, we would want them into spaces where there are other children that are not at their level of awareness. I want to see Children mentors, children retreats that are run by children, not adults, right? But that's how we work with that. And even further, children are going to need the ability to communicate. I can't say that enough. Children are going to need the ability to communicate with all types of different kinds of ideologies, so basically, the archetypes, they need to know how to speak. If it's a number five, I need to know how to speak to a number two. I need to know how to speak to a number nine. Why? Because when they master that, and I'm not saying this is the first thing is that they need to know themselves. Okay, this is just like eneology. We start off first by teaching you about yourself. And then we start working with getting you aware of what goes on with other numbers and how they communicate. But the reason why this becomes so important is that the future is not a place where you go and study something like just STEM and then you're getting this job because you study STEM, right? Nothing could be further from the truth. It's another tangent. You know, they're saying teach the children STEM and the science and the technology and the engineering and what is it, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. You teach them that and they're going to be ready for the future. <laughs> we're, we're doing it again. We're doing it again. That is another play. They're not looking for, and by the time this child comes to age of 18, 19, they're not going to be looking for a child that just went through STEM. Technology is going to make a quantum leap where that's not even going to be a part of what is needed. Everything's going to be templated, bolt on, out, out, uh, to, out of the box, as they call it. It's going to need no customization. It's already going to be ready. And when it makes its customizations, it'll do that by itself. But what it cannot do is it does not know how to harmonize and how to communicate with who's making the decisions with who's going to be there running the show or running those things. Also, even if that's not a part of where you want to go with your child in the future, as far as working in those kind of fields, it could be just working in a community. If this child does not know how to communicate, it's just going to be conflicts and they're not going to know where they really fit in. So when you teach the child who they are and how to communicate, they can thrive in any environment is what I'm saying. They will excel beyond even a person who's been doing it for 20 years. They will go right in and get a job that another person just came in and was interviewed 
and had 20 years experience and this other person comes in, this child that has this ability to communicate and knows themselves and the person doing the hiring will hire them because they like them. <laughs> That's it. Through that conversation, it was like so much clicking. I like this person. I like it versus that other one that's been to the professor. He's all, you know, he's got all of his, you know, his books and his credentials and he's about got the personality of a cardboard box. <laughs> and then the interviewer comes in and, you know, that's really also the person who had the communicative skills, too. So they're more of a people person. And then now they're sitting in front of an inanimate object, basically, after the person has numbed themselves through the compartmentalizations of this system. Versus when a person that knows how to communicate, especially with etiology, comes in, what's happening? The person's only seeing a mirror and a reflection. This is, man, I remember when I was that age. I was just like that. This is what goes on because this is the energetic field. Remember, we're spirits. So all these spirits are being, in, this spirit is being enveloped and influenced by another spirit. That's why we say, oh, I used to say that, that, that the strongest mind wins, right? All is mind. So what I'm referring to is, is that when this big aura walks in the room, it can be felt. So this child walks in the room or was a child and then the interviewer is there. They're feeling this person. I'm feeling you. You know what? I'm going to give you a shot. I know you don't know how to do any of this because this is really how it comes across. The, these kind of people, also, when you know yourself and you know how to communicate, you can really learn anything. And since most jobs are not based on if you learn the skill, but whether you have the experience, if you can learn what the skill is pretty fast, then you actually supersede someone who's already been to school for it but never worked in that position. I'm just giving you a full layout here. This is something that obviously I've thought about heavily, right? To come up with solutions. I got to apply the solutions in my life. So that's what I'm saying. So when that, when that being gets in there, they're going to like, you know what? I'll give you a shot. You start. We'll go through orientation. I'm going to put you under gym. We'll come back in a month and reevaluate the whole thing and see if, you, see if you can keep the job. And within that month, people are like trying to put him on the shoulders. You know, if they fire him, others may quit. So that's what I'm saying. You got to start really putting this thing together uh, in your own projection and seeing what's happening, being the fly on the wall, if you may, to the situations that are going on in order to prepare your children properly for what's going to uh, be occurring in the future. So the next question here is, what about those young, what about the young people who are more and more experiencing these frightening visits of negative, dark, demonic beings? What's the best way to change something uh, like this from happening and to fix it? OK, and at this stage, I'll, I will refer to children that are, uh, at, are at before the age of knowing. OK, so this is like 12, 13. And the reason why I'm saying that is because, you know, when you start going at your child, because they say, that, you know, the Khalil Gibran uh, statement is the most intrinsic to how we're raising children. And it basically says that you can do your best like a bow and an arrow. You can do your best to shoot this arrow straight. But once you let it go, now that's it. You can't take an arrow from the air and, and move it around a little bit so it hits the bullseye. So you have this certain period, if you may, to do as much as you can to raise a child up in the way that it should go. And then after that, it's going to do its thing. And you can only keep giving advice and, and, and admonishments and and things that you feel like are going to assist it. But at that point, it's up to them. And that kind of happens at 12, 13, somewhere in there. So we're going to say first before that phase hits. What you can do to prevent these kind of situations from occurring or to even allow the child to know what to do in these situations is one. Start clearing the space before you're going to sleep. If you find that this is happening now, now a nightmare every now and then is not something that you should raise alarms about. It's natural. There is a distorted side to our experience, and we have to deal with the yin and we have to deal with the yang. But if this is occurring often, because especially as a child's brain is developing, some things that it thinks are one thing, it may see that as a nightmarish way. Oh, my goodness, I was in a dream. There was only a bunch of cakes. And I just, it was cakes everywhere, and I couldn't breathe. And that could be a nightmare. You see what I mean? So you don't want to overdiagnose, right, and create things for the child that are not there. 
Also remember, the child is an extension of you in many ways. So you will find that if you have a nightmare, more than likely the child is also having a nightmare or is going to be having one in a few hours. So you can do some intervention because you are linked to this child. Okay. And then also sometimes the energies that you're bringing in, the things that you may be reading, the things that you may be doing are also going right there. It doesn't have to be communicated in English. We don't use English to communicate such things. It could be the essence. And now the child has picked up on this essence. So what do you do? Clear the space. You take the time to say, okay, it's about to be time for us to go to sleep. Let's sit in here and let's start clearing our palate. Now, I know that some of the parents do let their children watch TV. Not every single parent here on the line that's supposed to be holistic and conscious avoids allowing their child to watch TV, okay? There's a lot of pretending going on with that. We try to even filter out what they're watching, but they do, from time to time, even at school, get a hold of a TV. So, in this case, let's say in the modern reality, you have two or three different lines of defense right away to prevent what would be clearly a, a shade or a form from entering into your space and, or into your consciousness or your child's consciousness. And that's one, clearing the space, clearing the energy. Who's going to do that? Big, big, big time Palo Santo, big time Sage, corner to corner. I Meaning you go to the corners of your house. When you're saging, go to the corners even the closet corners, don't miss any corners, line by line. It even seems almost robotic. Just go down line by line and let that smoke touch up in the top corners because that's actually where these energies, that's why they show in a scary movie, the thing is all the way up on the wall and all of that. It's just metaphoric. Those energies, when you shut the lights on, they go into the corner because that is where the darkness is. That is the oob. So you sage corner to corner of the house or the room, right? Clearing the space. Also, if you know the child, maybe through school, maybe even something that you let them watch or, or has engaged in programming themselves with certain images, clear their palette. Meaning that you could do that with one, letting them draw or paint something before bed or watching some type of documentary that's just about nature, birds, Clear the palette so that way they basically lay, put a layer over all those images and interactions. And with that, you will probably be able to decrease 60 to 70 percent of these phantoms from being a part of the consciousness or the energy that is moving through the space. But then also remember that we're on a planet that we don't really know that much about. We're in a body that we're just now figuring out and exploring and discovering. There's a lot of other life forms and different kind of things moving through here at different times and different seasons. So don't over diagnose the situation as being that somehow some demon has taken over everything. Because when you do that, you give the charge to those kind of things. So use your wisdom in determining what exactly is going on and practice these type of methods. Resetting the mind, clearing the space. Okay, the other question was about expounding on numbers four and seven, and we've done that. We're getting to the final questions here. Uh, there's actually three. One question is I can't help but to notice some people on the plant-based diet seem really thin and almost malnourished, while others are well-built. What is separating them? <clears throat> are some just not meant to be vegan? Very sensitive question here, something that, you know, you can lose subscribers over this, like I care. But the reality here is, does every single animal here eat the same diet? Does even Earth, which is very akin to us, does it even consume the same things throughout the year? Doesn't it have like a seasonal thing going on, right? So what I, what I propose is a seasonal diet, right? And all of that is based on your own, so, so many different integers. That's why you got to listen to your body. You got like, it could be a yin and a yang thing with your body. You could have been a vegetarian for a long period and then your body says, okay, 
I'm not, I don't want to do this anymore. I need to yang it out. And you got to be prepared with your body to not be stuck in some kind of program or dogma and listen to your body and saying, okay, I guess I got to, you know, go in because my body is saying to do this. So I'm just saying for the record, no, there is not one diet for everyone. No, it is not that all human beings are vegetarians and should be only vegetarians and, and all of that. I used to believe that because I was a vegetarian. So anybody who, first of all, even being a vegetarian is a challenge when you have, when you're coming off of eating meat. So of course, you're going to remove every single thing from your mind. You're going to demonize meat. This is a way of staying away from it. Like, let's imagine if you quit, I don't know, smoking weed. Let's just use an example. You're going to have to demonize weed at that point. You're going to have to say, yep, weed is really bad for everyone. <laughs> weed, it's the, the devil's lettuce. And it, and it removes much of your brain cells. So you're going to keep reinforcing yourself with this so that way you don't go back to smoking weed. It's a process of you recovering from something to choose to do something else. But now is that the truth, though? I saw somebody saying the other day, like, yeah, we weren't, we're not supposed to be drinking milk. We weren't made to drink milk. So you're telling me if we arrive about a thousand years ago in the India and you tell them that they cannot drink milk, that that's going to fly? Not to mention your problems with milk. You may be lactose intolerant, right? You may get nightmares. You may get uh, uh, swelling up of your bones. But is that happening to everyone? No. So we have to use common sense with this kind of stuff and realize that what's most important is for you to be healthy. And we've talked about how the vegetarians are on the wrong diet and the meat eaters are generally on the wrong diet. The vegetarians are, you know, vegging out on oxalates, all this kale. They got a whole table full of kale. Just and then also these dogmas that are created, like newsflash, meat, Plants eat meat. <laughs> Plants eat meat. In the soil, there's so many worms, microorganisms, even carcasses from dead insects that the plant is chewing up to make the plant. So, and then there's another one that, you know, animals want to live. Trees do too. <laughs> Trees know when fire is coming. Trees know when they're being chopped. So, again, getting out of the dogmas and just saying, are you honoring it? The rules here are when you consume something, the life that you're living is whether you're honoring it or, what's the term I'm looking for here, um, disgracing it. OK, so meaning that if you just cycled something's existence or life. Right, because this is all a cycle, you will be consumed, too. You're being consumed right now. There are things that you're being consumed by and you're also regenerating. This is neo, this neophytes are sometimes oblivious to this. They don't even get the communion, the hunt, all of those kind of things and why they've been a part of our culture for since we've gotten here. Since the creation, and then you get others that just want to redo the creation. They just like, well, that's what that's what we did wrong. Now, Tim says <clears throat> that the algorithm is wrong. You see what I mean? So this just is a slippery slope of madness. It's about being stable and aware of this, of what's going on around you and inside of you, and then making the choices and the decisions based on how you're honoring and your integrity and your values. Okay. And that's what I have to say about that. So this next question is, it's our final question. When asked what sovereignty 2020 means by people who are either in doubt of this platform or unaware, how should I explain this? And I actually explained this in the, in the uh, explanation above about World War IV and how to win World War IV and just what sovereignty is doing for us on multiple levels. I've actually answered this question throughout our entire conversation, to be honest, because I've addressed one, the external sovereignties, the internal sovereignties. I've addressed enology and getting the manuals to our consciousness again. I've addressed removing oneself from this time thing, like anxiety that we're not accomplishing this all today and getting more seated and grounded into self. I've addressed working with our children with communication 
more and actually getting them into a space of understanding who they are, right? So all of these things are what we're referring to as sovereignty 2020. It is not a one-line statement because there's nothing about our existence that's a one-line statement. So, of course, we have some giveaways today. I have three gifts that I'm going to give away. I also wanted to say thank you to everybody who's been able to join the call today. It looks like we have 970 uh, concurrent viewers enjoying this build today, so that is amazing. You're, you're cherished, you're loved, you're welcome here. This is the symbiotic space. You know, what we do, you see what we do here? Like, not too much fighting going on in the chat. Everyone's here to assist each other. If you come up with a problem in this chat, you're going to get 10 solutions. Like, I may be saying something over here, like somebody will ask a question, another person answer the question. That's how we roll. That's how we do this. And ambassador training, it's even more of that. However, it is a work in progress. I know some want instant perfection. It's almost like people deal with me like they're dealing with Amazon or JCPenney, like they have this return policy on their life. <laughs> like that basically that we are under this obligation to be perfect for you. And, and that's not what we're doing here. I don't want you to mislead yourself into that. We're doing what we can. And also, if you're trying to make one person responsible for every single aspect of your life, that should just be yourself. Don't put that on anybody else. So I'm, I will be able to give you knowledge and wisdom. If you're around me, I may even be able to show you some love. I may be able to give you a hug. There are different things that I may be able to do for you, but I probably won't be able to do everything for you. So if you find something that I'm not doing, it doesn't mean that I don't know about it, I'm not aware of it, I'm not trying to do it, that I'm evil, that I have an agenda, and all of that. It's just that I have a lot of things going on, and I'm doing my best. And I'm setting that benchmark of what my best is I'm setting that with myself. And what I mean by that is, is that I found in life that if I was always basically trying to please other people, that that was really impossible, like real talk. Let me clear some of my lines here real quick. I know we may be getting some background noise. But basically that I, I would go into shambles because I could not please everyone at times. And the more I became mature, the more I realized just how impossible that was. But I also realized that if I was doing that for myself, though, that I could get very far. So meaning that I'm, if, I, if you could say I'm in a competition, I'm in a competition with myself. And that's why I kind of warn people that want to go into competition with me. I was like, yo, you better, you know, I don't think you want to go into competition because I'm in a competition with myself, and I started this competition a long time ago. And so you may have a little hard time even keeping up because I'm, like, updating the competition doubles every night. I challenge myself to do different things, like keep your mind quiet. There's a challenge. You know, every time I, I produce, I think a challenge is always something that is opposite than what you were already able to accomplish, to be honest. That's what I find is a real challenge. So if I find myself courageous and brave... My next challenge is to be compassionate in love because I got to keep this thing in the balance. Like if I got the fire going on, I got to figure out where the water is so that I can enjoy the steam. And I really go at myself like that. And I trust that because I do that or do my best at doing it, that those who do take the mentorship and say, you know what? There's certain qualities and characteristics that I like about this guy. I'm going to model certain things that I do on that that it is based on the examples that I give and that just be realistic for us being real or actual human beings, spirits, whatever is going on with us, unlimited, limited, unique, the same, all of that going on that one can understand that when you're, when you're working with stuff like that, you really have to be on point with your balance and things and that sometimes, especially when the moon moves in a certain way or the eclipse happens, you may not actually, it may not work out for you at that moment, but you live again. And in fact, you live forever. So let's do, the, let's do the drawing here. Let me get my screen capture ready. Today, let me look at my stuff here. Actually, I thought today was going to be a pretty shady transmission from it not being that great. 
And every time, meaning that, because I came in and, you know, like, especially coming off last week, it's like, how do you, how do you go, how do you come after last week? And that's what I was saying. That's the competition with self. And I was like, man, you know, I saw self from last week sitting there. I was like, you know, how do you come after this guy? And then so I also felt that this was going to be a very grounding and, like I said, it was going to be a, a, a breathing in type of conversation and type of build. So I was like, you know, that may not be as appealing. But now that I'm at the end of it, I'm like, you know what? This one came out for us very, very sound and very balanced. And, uh, and I'm always enjoying when that happens, especially, you know, even that we're able to transmit, seeing that every time we jump on here, there's always something going on with technology. So if you want to be entered into today's giveaway, the only thing you need to do is just type in wholeness into the chat. And what that does is that it enters you in for today's giveaway. We generally have giveaways every week unless we've given too much away. Like last, last week, there were so many gifts and gems. I felt like if I gave something away, then, you, you know, we, we'd be glutton at that stage. So today, though, you know, there was a lot of gems and things given. But since it's a Q&A, I want to make sure that we do our, our general weekly giveaway. So today, and let me just pull this up really briefly. Right. Let me see here. I have my gifts. All right. So today we are giving away one 15 gram bottle of She Legit. We're giving away one semester of the university of your choosing, whether it's semester one or semester two, which is about seven to eight courses, the complete syllabus. And we are going to give away one golden intonation. And again, in order to be a part of today's giveaway, you only need to type something in the chat within the next two minutes. I will also say that we've all received a great gift, each other. Like in this day and age and in this time, to be able to be on accord. Because, you know, it's not that there's just crazy things going on in the world. I never really saw the world where it wasn't crazy things going on, to be honest. It's that while all that stuff is happening, we're finding our way in it. And we're found, finding a foundation and we're also... Growing, I think you grow anyway through all your experiences, but we're growing up. We're actually allowing ourselves to come out of the, the, the dust in the, in, in, in the depths, and then we're springing forth. And I trust that as we emulate our parents and our ancestors, we'll be like trees. And not only will we produce fruit, but birds will be able to nest in us. Snakes will be able to dig their holes down there and keep the soil. You know, the worms will be able to move about the soil. New nutrients will grow. So all of that will continue and the fruit will fall from the tree and they will produce yet more. And we'll see ourselves as who, what we truly are, which is abundant beings. So we're very abundant. So wow, looks like we have a lot of entries today. And uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and do the screen share here. Give me a quick moment. Close down some of these windows. Also, I do wanna uh, let everybody know that you know if you were listening to this conversation today, maybe it's your first time in. Maybe you're still a little bit on the fence about the whole thing. If you want to learn a little bit more about yourself and dig in deeper to what we're talking about today, if this flew over your head and some of the stuff that I said, you know, it resonated, but it didn't make clear sense, you may want to consider joining Ambassador Training. Also, there's specialist training, but Ambassador Training, we have the 24-7 live chat going on with the tribe always on the build. We obviously have things that we're constantly incorporating to assist with sovereignty. We do revenue shares with all the products that we're providing on the site. We have another major product that's coming that's going to assist all of us in boosting up um, not only our uh, awareness of how we can get our body's energetic potential higher with this element, but also that we can begin to stabilize ourselves financially because there will be a higher um, commission. But I won't say anything about it until it actually delivers, which is always my way of doing things. Uh, but as of now, there are many things that are inside of Ambassador Training that you will enjoy. There's also recordings that you've never heard. I know that the YouTube channel is full of knowledge and I can't take anything away from it, but also inside of Ambassador Training, there are exclusive courses for things such as Enneology, the Meditation, Regeneration Roundtable, Sovereignty Mentorship, Creating a Projector, and all of those amazing things that we've done over the years that we've discovered through this esoteric knowledge. So without further ado, Oh man, my screen capture is gone. So let me just put my screen capture up. Video, screen capture, new screen capture. Bam. Okay. 
and then let me get this thing into the size of the screen. Scale to fit. All right, fam, just give me one quick second here. Okay, there it is, bam, there it happened. Okay, so let me push it. I know that changed up my screen. There we go. Okay, so what you're looking at over here, and I'll blow this up, is you're looking at all those who have entered into today's uh, drawing, and we're going to start off with the 15-gram bottle of She Legit. She Legit contains over 85-plus minerals. You know, the body is really akin to being like a battery. I guess I can explain some of this stuff before we give it away. The body is like a battery. So this means that, you know, if you know batteries, you know electrons and you know all this kind of stuff, you know that, you know, even heat, exhaustion, stress, all that stuff, it depletes the cells. So the body needs something to regenerate those cells and it needs minerals. If you notice, even plants need minerals. Everything needs minerals. She legit is a super mineral. It's already in case with what is necessary for the mineral to actually digest inside your body. And I'll explain that very briefly. Obviously, vitamins are, um, let's say you take a centrum vitamin. The particle is so large that it can't actually get into or be assimilable or be broken down for the body. She legit, it defeats those issues and it allows the elements and the essences to go into the body and for your body to have it in a form with the fulvic acid that allows it to break it down and to put it into the areas that it's needed most. So that's she legit. So here we go. Actually, I was playing everything now. Also, uh, with the university, I really got in and at least I think about a year, two years ago, maybe even longer, and started really putting in the knowledge that I felt was a great process of coming into this information. So a lot of people were saying, well, man, you're all over the place. And I was like, well, that's just kind of how I do things. What do you want me to do? They're like, man, if you can create like some type of curriculum where you could at least talk about one topic, that would help. So I put my intention into doing that, and I did that for two semesters. And I produced uh, seven different or eight different courses, depending upon which one you take. And I get into everything. So I go into diet. I go into anything that you can think of. It's fully encompassing everything about our existence in those university sessions. And so we're going to give away... Um, we're going to give away a semester of the university. And then finally, the golden intonation, which is the frequency that you hear me play sometimes before or after or during breaks or when something is broken during the show. And if you notice, it puts you into this kind of like, ah, like you're about to see the myriad before you. And that's because those are perfect ratios on the octaves. And what this allows is, is it allows, you know, THX was trying to accomplish that with that sound that they play but this is the perfect version of it put together by our frequency masters. And so that's the three things that we're going to give away today. She legit, the university and the golden intonation. So here we go. All right. I'm going to shut this window down and I'm going to blow this up. All right. So for our first uh, gift today, which is uh, she legit 15 G where's my button at roll it. All right, so K9, Wholeness and Balance Vibrations, you have acquired She Legit today. Where's my applause? I don't know if that's it because I can't hear my speakers, but I think that's my applause. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Wholeness and Balance Vibration, to redeem your gift uh, that you've won today, you only need to go to secretenergy.com and uh, go to the bottom right corner of the site and click on that button. You'll either get... Uh, more than likely Sean or myself, and you just need to leave your first and last name. And because this is a physical item, your address and your email address, your physical address and your email address, and we'll post that to you in the mail, K9. Hold us in balance vibrations. All right, so this next gift that we're going to give away is actually an entire semester of the university. That's about a $300 value. And so we're going to roll it again, and here we go, roll it. And that goes to our brother Jason Lynch, Wholeness and Balance Vibrations. I don't even know if that's the clapping button, so <laughs> let me see. They made, oh, excuse me, it made me clapping. Okay, it's not turned on. All right, anyway, I'll stop playing with it. Okay, so anyway, my little sound bite today, I have to try that next time. I'm probably talking over it right now. Four, three, two, one, and it's over. Okay, I won't push it again. Thank you so much for joining and connecting with us today. 
and you are to, you know, you got the luck with you today. So you can redeem uh, your semester of the university by simply jumping into the chat uh, down at the bottom right hand corner of Secret Energy and just let us know your email address and your name and we'll get you enrolled. All right. So this final gift is for a golden intonation to keep the meditation going and to clear the space, especially. And here we go. Bada bing, bada boom. I am stardust, wholeness and balance vibration. You have won the golden intonation for today. Again, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, all you also, of course, uh, I am. All you need to do is contact tact us on the base of the website, and we'll be able to get with you. Give me just a quick second. Let me get my screens back under control over here. And here we are. So that's what we have for today, Secret Energy, Episode 10. I don't think it disappointed this is all the time that we've put together in order to be able to connect and to begin to know more about ourselves. Have a great day. You know, love somebody, cherish some things, get out there, dive into nature, you know, see what this existence has for you. And if you felt depressed, you know, just think about how you even get a chance to be depressed. Start really, you know, finding different ways within yourself to be comfortable with who you truly are. We love you. We wouldn't do this if we didn't. And we've created a space where we all can connect and we can all share. So thank you so much. See you soon.